Um, talking about today's ecology is both a thrill and a threat, and a thrill through a threat. A thrill first because we are summoned by compassion, which leads to a broadened heart and mind. This compassion is not a virtue, but a fact. We are feeling with, suffering with the other living. The extinction crisis affecting other species affects us, not only as a mirror of our own death, but because we feel explicitly that we are linked to, this, uh, to these other species in what is known as an ecosystem. The threat here is a thrill and good news in the sense that we are forced to move from an analytical uh, to a synthetic mindset. The analytical mindset separates things one from another so that the thing can be thought. Now we see, and moreover through the disaster, we feel that everything is connected, as it is put by the general title of our Congress. And it is good news for my conscience, exciting because extending. Now I discover I'm not talking first with a microphone, but with a microbiota. Now um, I discover I'm not, uh, uh, I, I discover that my, my speech depends on the sun and the sea, my breath is related to trees as their spiritual fruit, and this conference in Frankfurt is frankly less far removed from the rainforest than it seems. The thrill is also due to the fact that we are in some kind of crime investigative thriller. As in the opening of Oedipus Rex, there is a plague Nature goes into rebellion. Uh, I quote, a rust consumes the buds and the fruits of the earth. The herds are sick, children die unborn, and labor is vain. It was already a problem. We have to investigate, even if it means exposing our cessity when we claim to be clairvoyant. Here, the pattern of tragedy already emerges. This is the, the title of my, of my speech. The good detective appears to be the blind assassin. The modern man who wanted to make the world a better place turns out to be the destroyer of the environment. The one who has solved the enigma has sunk into its mystery and now must cry out to the gods. Because the tragedy begins after a victory, after the Sphinx is defeated. Naturally, we moved on to the threat, which is inseparable from the thrill. But the age of this threat is not just material. It is mainly spiritual and even intellectual. It is not the exterior threat that ecology makes us aware of, but the threat that is intrinsic to ecology. Therefore, its awareness, like that of Oedipus, can be a disregard, an obliviousness. What if ecological concerns were distracting us from more fundamental vigilance? For example, we are at a conference on ecology and we are communicating through techno-capitalistic devices. Computers, video projectors, microphones, electric lights. Is it daylight outside or night already? Doesn't matter. Matter doesn't matter. Our minds are so focused on our speech about nature that we prefer the artificial and inevitable conditions of an international congress. Furthermore, and more seriously, can ecology escape the grip of technology? 
As the American philosopher Albert Borgman says, in dealing with the problem of technology, we turn easily to technological standards. This is in line with what Pope Francis says. Our era is ruled by a dominant technocratic paradigm. If it is a paradigm, it permeates all areas of life and drives us to a paradox. Ecology is under control. Ecology in itself is using the technocratic standards of control. And when we are talking about the ecosystem, it is the system that prevails, not the oikos, the home. This threat is echoed in the very title of our meeting, Everything is Connected. Where is the word connection most uttered today? On the internet. The living relationships are read through this greed, this grip of global computing. Green is the light on our dashboard. Organic is a sales pitch. We are not talking about culture, nor the long passionate work of farming and breeding accompanying the natural growth of a plant or a beast, we are talking about connections. And we calculate parameters. We try to manage a worldwide net, not the Tiberiad fisherman's net, but the network of efficiency, considering the universe as another metaverse. To save everything, click here. Send an email and plant a tree would you please give me the remote control for the planet, and if not, give me a hole in the head? From this point of view, nature is the magnificent machine equipped with this amazing invisible algorithm, which doesn't need our intelligence nor responsibility, because it never works better than when the human race is out of the game. I know that everything is connected is the refrain of the Pope's encyclical. But just as Diogenes proves the movement by walking, the Pope proves the technocratic paradigm by not being able to extricate himself entirely from its influence. This is not an accusation or else an accusation against myself. Nobody is immune from this influence. Technology now is our first environment, which shapes our view of the natural environment, if such a thing can even exist. We need to acknowledge this, this bias, a bias in our vision of bios, so that we may be able to correct it and to think ecology otherwise. When I say ecology otherwise, I mean it literally. It's about thinking ecology through the wisdom of the other. This is the reason why I will use the word tragedy. Tragedy implies a relationship with the most other of others, a vertical relationship with the gods, with what or whom we may call the transcendent. Misfortune is not enough to define the tragic genre, unless we hear fortune as a proper name, the name of some sort of divinity. Death and disaster can happen, and it can be drama, nonsense, even a farce or a mafia movie, but the godfather is not a god. In order so that to be a tragedy, death and disaster must have a mysterious dimension coming from a word from above, an oracle, a prophecy, the three witches of Macbeth, and suddenly fool is fair. The main character is struck by lightning, and he cries out not against human society, but against the heavens. Why? His why is less a question than a supplication. It springs 
from a broken heart, striving for a who, not a what, a consolation, not a, an explanation, a hope, not a tip. Perhaps I'm going too fast. Some may have already understood that tragedy refers to that which is irreducible to technology, which cannot be integrated by any system. But its relation to ecology is still unclear and might, and might look unclean, forced by an arbitrary prospect. Thus, I have to go back to the announcement of our panel. It invites us to rediscover the spirit of nature. Well, this invitation sounds like Laudato Si, but slightly shifts its significance. Just read paragraph 76, and you will even go so far as to admit that the slight shift is a big mistake. I quote, in the Judeo-Christian tradition, the word creation has a broader meaning than nature, for it has to do with God's loving plan in which every creature has its own value and its significance. Nature is usually seen as a system which can be studied, understood, and controlled, whereas Creation can only be understood as a gift from the outstretched hand of the Father of all and as a reality illuminated by the love which calls us together into universal communion. Listening to this paragraph, we don't have to rediscover the spirit of nature, but that the concept of nature is insufficient. If you allow the paradox, I would say that it is, it's insufficient because of its sufficiency. Either sufficiency from a, for a human efficiency. It means nature, according to modern physics, seen as a system which can be understood and controlled. Either sufficiency of the cosmos. It means nature, according to ancient philosophy, seen as a harmonious and autosufficient whole. But the Pope seems to cast a snag in the plan, if not a snake in the garden. Let us even say a hole in the hole. The, world, the word nature is not in the Hebrew Bible. You can find within its verses heavens and earth, trees, birds, fish, walking and creeping beasts, each one after his kind, in brief, creation. And you have the right to ask, what's the difference? Overall, creation is an article of faith, better say nature, more common, more ecological. Firstly, I will respond to this last objection. It is possible to criticize the concept of nature through reason before criticizing it through revelation. If we cling so tight to the concept of nature, it's out of reaction because we are in a spooky age, the age of the end of nature. And this end is so huge and heavy that we fall into denial. If we take the word nature in the sense of the ancient cosmos, we must admit that this view is not possible anymore. Greeks, Stoics more particularly, saw the world as a perfect order where the blood stains were part of the beauty of the picture as soon as the spirit was elevated enough. They knew about death and evil, of course, but they thought that naturally life was stronger. The arrow of history was wrapped in the cycle of the seasons. 
species were immortal. The circle of birth and death appeared to be everlasting, so that birth or rebirth could always prevail. The name nature derives, derives from this spring experience. The Latin word natura, translating the Greek fusis, comes from nascor, to arise, to be born. But what happens if we know that the down is doomed and the spring is star-crossed? What happens if we are scientifically sure that live nature is running out of steam, not only because of the techno-capitalistic system, but because of its own finitude, its oddity and exceptionality in the universe? What happens, well, uh, if we know, uh, if, we, if, we, if we now live in the imminence of extinction, where death must definitively prevail over life. From our current, our current cosmic and evolutionary point of view, life is the random exception, and nothing is more natural than extinction. And we should change the name from nature to moriture. You know, like in the salutation, no ritual, it is salutant. Is it possible with such lucidity to base ecology on the concept of nature? And in any case, how could ecology not be tragic? On the other hand, if we take the word nature in the sense of modern physics, we must admit that it designates a set of objects submitted to laws that are indifferent to good and evil. The aim of all modern science is to objectify, and thanks to this objectification, to make us like masters and possessors of nature. The Cartesian project is based on charity, don't forget that. It is good, charitable, to see a living being as a machine, to distinguish its parts and its function, to be able to fix it. But the efficiency of this objectification imply, implies to ignore the living as a subject and a free gift. The donum is reduced to data. We are computing this data instead of contemplating the donum. Such contemplation is criticized as dreaming poetry, the most useless thing, and much less than a thing. From the standpoint of modern physics, and this is especially true at a nanometric scale, it doesn't matter if the object is organic or not, dead or alive. Of course, techno-science can give you understanding and control, a dominion on nature, but it is in itself a dominion without design nor desire, a dominion of the unliving, a dominion of despair. Grounded on this data device, spotting the Earth not as a soil, but as a planet, looking at, lo looking at it through a satellite system, there is no way that ecology can escape the technocratic paradigm. Thence, we avoid to fall by running to the failure. And worse than the failure, our complete integration into the global circuit. Here is another dimension of tra tragedy coming up with techno-ecology. Techno exactly like Oedipus, our efforts to flee from a fatal destiny make it flow upon us. The gateway serves 
serves the entrapment. We can turn back to our much abused phrase, everything is connected. My purpose is not to shoot it down, but to unfold its very depth, lest it becomes a totalitarian formula. Interpreted from the concept of nature as a whole, left on a plane of immanence, it is a deadly principle. For the whole is greater than the part. The part is not worthy unless it fits in the general functioning of the whole. So it is, it is no problem to destroy the part for the whole's sake. There is no sorrow in letting a species disappear. Nature, nature tore up the dinosaur's page without a tear. It has no eternal kindness for this or that kind. Only the little man regrets the T-Rex. The Pope says, God has, it's a quotation of Laudato Si, uh, God has joined us so closely to the world around us that we can feel the desertification of the soul almost as a physical ailment and the extinction of a species as a painful disfigurement. We feel painfully the disfigurement, not nature. What's more, in order to be closely joined to the world, we ought to be in the world, but not of the world. The very proximity requires a distance and over there from which we can move closer. It is impossible to pull anyone out of the quicksand of the quicksand except from above. I'm not referring to an extraterrestrial point of view, but to a transcendental one. Declaring everything is connected. Pope Francis highlights a vertical and vertiginous connection, which is no longer with a thing, which no more fits into the everything. I mean, a connection with God and his loving plan in which every creature has its own value and significance. Own value supposes something beyond connection. Suddenly, we remember that God created the world not only connecting, but dividing, separating first. So the relation can be a real relation from one to an other. Further on, the Pope writes that we have to think of the whole as open to God's transcendence within which it develops. He underlines, he highlines the whole in the whole so we can switch from the grip of nature to the gift of creation. With the end, well, what I call the end of nature, the concept of nature, of course, with the end of nature, we can rigorously hear the and of our Congress, ecology and theology. We can now understand that theology here doesn't pop up like an ad on the ecological screen. The link between the two turns out to be essential. Very deep ecology leads us to theology. Not only in theory, but also in practice. By saying practice, I don't mean concrete solutions with much, which must be provided by, by experts and even more so by those who are familiar with their land. I mean the condition and driving force of all living practice, hope. 
If the Earth is naturally bound to become an ice cube due to, a, to the exhaust, exhaustion of its internal radioactivity, and then a fireball kicked off by the explosion of the sun, how can we naturally save, naturally save the planet? Why save a species if nature is at last indifferent to the existence of species? Because of the singing tomorrows? No, because of today's essential song. The overriding reason is theological. I quote the Pope, each of the various creatures willed in its own being reflects in its own way a ray of God's infinite wisdom and goodness. We have to preserve this peculiar ray with its special fantasy because it is willed and manifests God in its own insubstitutable way. The good book allows us to read the ant or the worm as a revelation. From this main theological reason follows an anthropological one. I quote again, man must therefore respect the particular goodness of every creature to avoid any disordered use of things. We said that Adam has been created to keep and cultivate the garden. This is not just a matter of usefulness nor survival. It is basically a matter of being and being created in the image of God so we unfold ourselves by extending divine generosity. This is not to say that we are deaf to the death sentence. We have heard this sentence deeply and we can no longer act except by grace. Tragedy is the springboard for transfiguration. Moreover, ecology can't simply rely on the psychology of survival. A living being desires to live, not to survive. The bird sings not to preserve itself. It preserves itself to sing. So the robin's melody can stay a little longer, for it is nearly evening and the day is almost over. To be saved is not to keep you safe. To be saved is to live, and to live is to spread life up to the point of sacrifice. Life is received to be given. The absolute preservation is the look of Medusa. You are a statue. Nothing can happen to you. You will last much more, for you don't live anymore. We must recognize it. The longer, not the better. A rose that fades so quickly is better than a stone. But the rose, through the brevity of its offering, is more in touch with eternity than the stone, which is certainly more in touch with perpetuity. The rose fleeting perfume is of more praise, more incense than any bare solidity. As Emmanuel Levinas says, you know the great French Jewish philosopher, the real deep question and real challenge for us is not why is there something rather than nothing, but he says, the unnatural question, the question against the very naturalness of nature. Is it right to be? 
Life doesn't consist first and foremost in persevering in being, fighting for the survival of the fittest, but in pursuing the good, doing justice and having mercy, even if, especially if it leads, it leads to martyrdom. Because being, beyond the essence, is being created, being willed and saved and attracted by God, the holy, beyond the holy. It is interesting to point that the question emerges also through, is another sense, among extreme environmentalists. Is it right for man to be? Wouldn't it be better if this super predator disappeared? The problem here is that the question is not radical enough. It deserves to be extended to all beings and to assume that, alas, the super predator is the only one able to ask and answer the question. Remembering that he is the garden keeper and that his vocation is to dwell in love, in just, uh, dwell in love and justice and not in lust and fitness. When you read carefully Laudato Si and try to catch what ecological conversion is about, you find that it is not an environmental add to the social teaching of the church, but the spin-off of a general theology of mission. Ecological conversion is missionary conversion not from a proactive but a pro-contemplative attitude. The stake is to remind that, as Pope says in Gaudate et Exultate, that life does not have a mission, but is a mission. Life is a mission. In Laudato Si, the Pope quotes the Catechism. Creatures exist only in dependence on each other to complete each other in the service of each other. Take any apple tree as the tree of knowledge. Bearing its fruit is its own fulfillment, but this fulfillment is also a service to others beyond its own kind. Why so much pulp and so little seed? Why so many seeds and so few new apple trees? We may guess that the apple, crowning the tree's life, is waiting for the apple pie. Or for the apple worm. Or for happy finches. And if it is not waiting for them, doesn't matter. It is serving them, unconsciously carrying out a mission. Mission is the, act is the action of being sent by another, for another, with others, to carry something beyond the envoy's comprehension. Bearing apples is mission for the apple tree. The interdependence between creatures is not just an ecosystem. It is about the communion that is established through the missionary dimension of life. But, this is my conclusion, the cross is planted in the heart of mission. Now I have to do my duty exasperating people with the dogma of original sin. There is something wrong with nature. As we have seen, without need of faith, nature is not truly nature because its birth power is obviously overwhelmed by its trend towards its extinction. The spring has broken, not recently, but since the beginning. 
It's been 28 centuries since Hesiod regrets the Golden Age. And St. Paul did not wait for the climate change to assert as a common and self-evident statement, we know that all creation is groaning in labor pains even until now. Creation in itself is driven by the desire to be free from slavery to corruption and share in the glorious freedom of the children of God. The service of each other is crossed by the struggle against each other. The cheerful emulation is mixed up with the deadly competition. And at the end, everything is disconnected. Everything returns to stardust without memories. But, you know who I'm quoting? Well, the first pope. According to, this, to his promise, we await new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. Here is the unbeaten path between tragedy and transfiguration. The past embedded in the impasse. As the book of Proverbs goes, I lead in the way of righteousness, in the midst of the path of judgment, that I may cause those that love me to inherit substance, and I will fill their treasures. Ecology cannot only be a matter of preservation, keeping everything safe to the point of suffocation and petrification. Nor, of course, can it be the waste of everything without changing our techno-capitalistic, I can say lifestyle, maybe death style. As I underline, life is not ultimately about self-preservation, but self-exposure. Keeping forgiving and not giving for keeping. If we take care of other species, it is not primarily for reasons of survival, but so that charity may shine, may shine as long and as widely as possible on earth. It is to walk in righteousness while hoping to dwell in righteousness within a renewed creation. Thank you for the attention.